Furious Driving, proud to be supported by Diamond Bright, protecting, cleaning and caring for the Furious fleet and for yours with 10% off using code FD10. Bidding Classics, the online classic car marketplace with more cars added every week. And Lancaster Insurance cover the Furious fleet. They are one of the biggest specialist insurers in the UK covering all areas of vintage to modern classic cars and motorbikes. Follow the links in the description below. Hello and welcome to Furious Driving and this is my rather delightful 2002-3 Rover 75 1.8 turbo and this is some genuine wood dashboard for one. Now this car has only been on the fleet for a few weeks but you guys seem to have taken it to your hearts. Not least some of the viewers have even been kind enough to send in some rather lovely pieces. Anthony, thank you very much indeed, supplied me with a complete genuine wood wooden dashboard for the 75 because as you may or may not know in the early noughties Rover decided to absolutely destroy their reputation and their heritage with the thing they called Project Drive. They were trying to sell cars as a premium product and what they did was cheapen it as they went to try and save a few pennies per car in order to make a little bit more profit on each vehicle. However, this was at the expense of the premium feel which the cars were being sold as, as premium cars for. So along with a number of other bizarre little choices, the uh, badges that go on the seat post disappeared, saving 4p per car. The twin tone horn, which made the car sound mellifluous and extravagant and wealthy, vanished. It's a single meh tone horn now. And most notably, the thing you see from the driver's seat, the wooden dash became a plastic dash. Let's get inside because it's, it's May and yesterday I was wearing Factor 50 and today I'm shivering. Let's get inside the car and talk more about this. Okay, so in the tradition of finest British cars of all time, the 75 has got lots of wood across the dashboard. We even got the wooden steering wheel in this car now. And yes, I know it's the wrong shade of wood because there are two different tones you could have had. However, finding the correct tone these days is rather difficult. Beggars cannot be choosers. Now the wood was all over the front of the car. We've got the entire top slab up here. We've got a little eyebrow just here. This whole area below the HVAC and radio is all timberified, as is the surround for the gear stick and the hazard warnings and central locking over here. Now the look of the genuine wood and the fake wood is very similar. They did a, they did a pretty good job of, uh, of faking it. However, there is a slight difference in terms of the grain itself. The, the genuine wood is it's a softer, more organic look. The, uh, the fake grain, it's very good, but there's something not quite right about it. And also, and this is the big clincher if you know these cars particularly well, but the real tell when you're sitting in the car is the airbag logo here on the front of the passenger. On the later ones, the fake wood, it's a separate badge that's recessed into the panel. On the original real wood, it's actually silver writing, which is behind the lacquer. So you can run your hand over it, can't even feel it. That's uh, obviously a little bit more craftsman than the you can probably see just there, it does look very smart indeed. And it's completely flush and feels like a quality item. Now, now Anthony very kindly offered these for the junk in the trunk, which I was happy to accept because this car has actually got a crack underneath one of the air vents, which is apparently a fairly common thing for these cars to happen to for some reason. So I did need to replace this main dash panel anyway. So if I'm gonna replace that, it'd be rather nice to replace a lot with wood. As I looked into the panels that he'd, uh, he'd kindly given me, I realized that not everything was real wood, only the entire top section was wood, but the eyebrow on these lower parts were the, um, the plasticized fake wood. And also as I looked into it more, I realized that the backing of it gives it away. This is the, um, the air vent panel that came with the real wood set, set that Anthony provided. And if you look at it closely, it's got a smooth aluminium backing and you can actually see the plastic backing of this panel, which means this is not actually real wood. This is a, a later one, there's a build date on it, of uh, July 2002, which is well into Project Drive. So I did a bit of hunting around on eBay, found a seller who was selling more bits of wood and having compared it to the other panels that I now had, you can see that the original wood panels have got this metal, well, it's like a goldy coloured textured backing. And this one's a build date of July 2001, so it's a whole year older. And you can actually see the back of it, you can see the laminate on the edges, so you know this is a real wood dash. 
Then I actually spoke to the seller, I sent him a message asking if he had any other genuine wood parts for the rest of the dashboard. And his opinion, and something I've actually sort of found online as well, is that only the top part of the dashboard was ever real wood. Everything else was always the pretend wood, as, as far as I can tell. I stand to be corrected. If someone has an earlier car, maybe a Cowley built car perhaps, which is the first few months of production before BMW moved uh, the 75 production out of what became the mini factory and gave it all to Rover to, to do somewhere else. Um, <laughs> if the owner's got any of those real wood bits and I've seen a date on them, I'd be fascinated to know that. But as far as I know, the rest of this stuff is only ever going to be the, the faker plastic stuff. So I'm not going to bother with this stuff, but I am going to replace this broken one. I'm going to replace the airbag panel. And this one is going to be a little bit tricky because this real wood panel was supplied without any air vents in it. So I'm going to have to dismantle either this one from 2002 or this one that came with the car and get the vent out of here. Also, because the clock is built into this, I will make sure it works <laughs> before I uh, bolt everything together. Now, let's start taking this stuff apart. Apparently it's quite easy. Famous lost words, eh? Right, so the tools you actually need to do this are really surprisingly limited. Um, most of this pulls or levers out, so you want to get yourself some trim tools, or I've even heard people do wooden spoons, um, and then if you need to disassemble anything on the back, you need to disassemble some bits on the back of the airbag, and I'm going to have to transfer these bits over from here. You're going to need a T10, I've got a screwdriver, but a Torx bit in a socket will also work. Right, and this one apparently is the easiest of all to start with. So let's begin at the beginning, as they say, with this air vent. Oh, incidentally, I had my first disaster with this car the other day. My tea fell off the boot when I was jet washing it because there's a bit of grime underneath and I jet washed it off. So now I generally can have a tea shelf uh, or a lower tea shelf. Uh, I'm so funny, sometimes it hurts. Right, so let's do this. Wow, it does literally just pop out. And I'm not going to damage anything else because I want to be able to resell this separately to fund continued work on the car. And the other cars, of course. Wow, that is literally it. That is the old one out. So that's just held in by these little springy clips on the back. So a bit of force, a bit of gentle force, and out it comes. Okay, so what I need to do next is to reassemble this new wood panel with parts from, well, an air vent from one of these. I've got the choice of the one that came with the full set of real wood, which this obviously isn't, which is from July 2002, or I can use the one that came with the car from, well, this is actually made in October 2002. This will utterly baffle any future historians taking the car apart. This one actually looks a little tiny bit nicer, I think. Um, what's this? Yeah. Yeah, this one's, this one that is a, a spare, it looks a little tiny bit yellowed compared to this one, which is a nice, nicer shade of gray. So I'm gonna use this one. So all it is, holding it all together, are a pair of T10 screws on the back. So just wind those out. And of course they have these two clips on top of them, which are facing the bottom of the panel. So I'm going to put them back in the right way up. And finally, there is one third screw up here. And this all just, that's, hang on, that's actually tight. And that then all holds the plastic clip. Oops, there we go. And that plastic clip comes off there. That comes out of there and you've now got one spare bezel or a bit of trim. And this can now go neatly, keep it the right way up. New bit of wood with the shiny backing on it. That just pops into there. Slots straight through. Actually looks a neater fit than it is in the plastic. And that slides back into place, like so, with the, the long end over there. And to quote the Haynes manual, refitting is the reverse of the first bit, taking it out backwards or something. I always get that bit wrong. There we go, just screw it all back together with your T10. Of course, making sure that your little clips are pointing in the right direction, otherwise it will not snap back together later on. In fact, there is a ridge on there, on here which does keep that pointing in the right direction. This is going into plastic, so don't over tighten it. Just tighten it up until it's firmly done up, not ridiculous and about to strip the plastic because you will obviously regret that if you do. But you don't want it nicely tight because you don't want any rattles and things because this is a Rover, it shouldn't be rattling. 
And that is now all done. And you see you've got the dial on the front that opens and closes the vent. And you've got your movable vent axis just there, the flaps, all good. So I'll leave this off the car for the moment because we want to have access to the airbag. We'll come back to that in a moment. Right, next up, the airbag. Now, before we do the airbag, we're going to disconnect the battery on the car uh, and let it sit for a few minutes because obviously we don't want the airbag going off in our faces. Now, very usefully, I still have in the glove box the spanner I bought up in Pontefract when I had to change this battery on the road. So we can disconnect this, let the airbag discharge for a few minutes before we touch it. I should probably sort out this thing. Now I've got all my tools here as well because that's still a bit slack. Bag. Instantly, if you're looking around the car and wondering what this thing is, this is actually an FM transmitter as well as a USB socket for charging my phone so I can play Bluetooth, audible and music and stuff through this to the radio because this car obviously is too old to have a Bluetooth link. Anyway, by the by, I'll put a link to that thing in the description down below. I just know some people are going to notice that thing and ask what it is. So, and I believe, once I've pried this one loose, there we go. So what we're actually taking off here is not the airbag itself, just the cover which comes away from the airbag in an explosion on these straps here. And what I hadn't realised is they're held on with anti-tamper torque screws. I thought I could use a regular torque screwdriver. In fact, I'm going to have to use a T20 anti-tamper torque. You see, it's got a little hole drilled in the end of the uh, thing. Where's the T20 gone? Here we go. And the person who stripped this out of another car, instead of undoing these bolts, actually saved a fair bit of time by just cutting through those restraint straps. The point of this is that that flips up and stays there on the dashboard rather than hitting you in the face, which is probably quite a good idea. So if I undo these, these torxes, they're a plural of torx. Now I don't know if I need to take all seven of these screws out or just the four that are around the straps themselves. I've never taken one of these panels apart before. This is very much a learning curve. And of course, I will have to do this on the uh, panel in the car as well to get this out. Yes, I do need to take all seven out, apparently. And this panel is called, on the sticker on the back of it, the right-hand airbag substrate, if you're curious about such things. And it's interesting, looking at the back of this panel, you can actually see the uh, the layers of the wood, because it's a, uh, a laminate, a veneer, laminate veneer, we call it that, I don't know. Went to Elton Palace at the weekend, it's an English heritage place, and uh, they've got some beautiful veneer, inlaid veneers in the famous reception hallway. Pictures of Venice made of tiny bits of wood, very interesting, if you like such things. Now, it looks like there is actually uh, Loctite on these screws, so we'll be sure and put some of that back on when the stuff goes back into the car. And it's quite a good idea to do this on the one that's not on the car, because I can see how it all comes to together, comes apart. On this side, there we go. Okay, yep, yeah, so that just undoes from that. Okay, so what I can possibly do, oops a daisy so these are the anchor points. This is like a webbing strap, like a seatbelt, that holds the um, this panel into the car. In the event of an explosion, it will not explode in your face. Always a good thing. Incidentally, this panel dates from November 2000. Okay, so now I just need to do exactly the same thing, upside down, inside the dashboard. Okay, last one. And out it comes. Yeah, it is easier in the end to just get an extension bar. It's a really handy little draper short one with a spanner socket thing on the end. Um, I got from the NEC. That should then come apart like so. There we go. And I could actually just leave that like that and put the new one on top of it. In fact, I think I might just do that. I've only got to get this main panel out here. I'm told what we need to do is to first of all, lower the steering wheel right down and then start prying from the far end. Okay, so we're back to our pry tools again. Uh, let's find a couple of appropriate ones. So we'll start off over this end and literally just pry the thing out of the dashboard. And out it pops. There we go. Gotta be careful because we have got this broken bit just there. 
but then just kind of feed it out. And out it comes, as easy as that. The um, air vents themselves are just like a foam backed thing to, there we go. Now before we go any further, we have got a couple of things to disconnect. First of all, here in the center, we've got this like bicycle brakes control wire, which is the control for the airflow dial on the front. And we've also got a power lead going up to the clock. So this, you just have to very, very carefully lever it forwards and out of there and off it pops. This is definitely a two-handed job. There we go, with the, um, I think it's called the vent bypass. If that's clipped in, so you can unpry that and then get a little bit more clearance to undo this. There we go, and that is free. There's not a peg to squeeze or anything, but it is very tight into there. And I'll take this out with extreme care because it is quite a fragile thing. And this one, as I say, is already cracked, but it's only cracked on the wooden front. It does have a metal backing, so it shouldn't be too fragile as you do it. Right, next thing, give everything a good clean up before it goes back together. Okay, this is an unparalleled opportunity to get into all the nooks and crannies you can't normally get to. Interior cleaner from Dunn Bright, just to give everything a nice wipe over and all the bits you can never normally get a cloth into. And I think this car might have been smoked in at some point. That's at some point for the last 20 years. <laughs> there is a fair amount of grot in the places you can't generally get to. So I'm going to clean this and I'm also going to clean the new panels before they go on. So yeah, before I put these back into the car, I am going to give all these panels a nice clean up because I can get them looking really good and get into all the bits that are normally covered by the rest of the dashboard mouldings, get the whole thing looking as clean as possible. The old diamond bright interior cleaner doing us, a, doing us proud just here. Oh, look at that, it's beautiful. Beautiful. Right, let's put that back in the car to keep it safe. Now, as well as cleaning up this main section, there is something else I did notice. This real wood section, the foam, has broken down quite badly on these air vents, and the one that's just come off the car has got really nice foam on it. So what I'll do is switch these air vents over between the two panels, so we've got the nicer air vents going onto the car. Incidentally, Volvos make really good workbenches because they're so big and flat. And uh, incidentally, this thing I'm working on is uh, a diamond bright microfiber towel and also a work surface as it goes. So as you can see, this is the, the panel that just came out of the car. This is the, I guess a year or two later one. And this is the real wood panel. And you can see how much, or how badly this foam is just falling apart my fingers. So I will get rid of that. That can go away and this can go back into the car because then we'll get better airflow into the cabin, nothing being lost to the sides behind the dashboard. This also is from November 2000, so I guess that's from the same car as the airbag panel. Incidentally, this is called the R40 clock because this is an R40. As with the air vent on the passenger side, this is just a bunch of T10 screws that hold it all together. That's one goes over there. This one comes off here. And as I said with the um, passenger air vent, must make sure you get these clips the right way around, otherwise you're gonna have a world of hurt when it comes to putting all this stuff back together again. So lay them out in a way that me makes sense to you so you can actually reassemble it. And that goes just there. What I think I might do, because I don't know if this clock works or not, I might just switch that clock over as well. As with anything like this, it's not difficult, just go slowly and methodically enough to keep an eye on what you're doing so you know what you're putting back together again. If you're unsure, take photos. Two more on the end, which I've managed to miss. Okay, so this should now just all lift off. There we go. One piece like that. That comes out like that. Clock, whoops, daisy, lifts out like that. Just keep that switcheroo going over. You don't need to switch over all the other little bits and bobs, but because it's all from the same batch of plastic, I quite like the idea of doing it because then 
it all matches. The clock goes in first because it fits over these little pegs in the center. Then the blend controller goes on top of that and everything else sits on top of that. And this big bracket here goes on first to hold it all in place. Now if you're doing one of these changes you might not need to do this. This is very much just because I want it all to be as lovely as possible. But I'm making extra work for myself. My main worry is of course that I get all these clips to right around because if I don't I'm going to cause myself lots of trouble in a couple of minutes. The 10 screws in each plus little catch is all put back together again. So this is all now as it should will and will in fact be tightened up nicely so we've got a good felt on the real wood and the older slightly worn felt on the plastic wood. Now we just need to do the, well there's only two screws that hold these ones on, so we'll quickly switch these over. This is more of the same but significantly easier because there's only two screws in each one, but obviously of course make sure that these do stay the right way around. There we go. This is the thing that old plastics and rubbers and glues do deteriorate over time, so make sure you find the best ones for your, your project and your application. Nice shiny new ones going in there. Because I'm now thinking about it, what I should have done is cleaned up the edges of the actual nozzles themselves while I was having them out of there. Oh. So even they get dusty around the edges. So I've missed an opportunity with those two. I'm not taking them out again. That's too many screws. Yeah, it is interesting. These are a snugger fit into the apertures on the real wood than they are to the, uh, the plastic wood. There we go. And that is now beautiful and done. And these are actually really nice set of, of vents that were in the car, really lovely sort of black plastic um, compared to some of the plastics I've seen which have gone a little bit yellow over time. So this is really nice. Now refitting as they say is the reverse. So you know, a few things to do carefully. First of all, you're trying to smush up this foam too much whilst we're refitting things. Feed it all back in there carefully. Whoops, daisy, there we go. And then I'm going to reconnect the clock first of all. Who knew a tiny plug would be the hardest thing of all? Then, now this is going to be the tricky part. Oh, yeah, yeah. The part I'm really well, not looking forward to is actually refitting a little peg just there. I could do with a headlamp right now, and I do have a head torch from the same range of Draper rechargeables. However, it fell off the back of a car and landed in a pan of used engine oil, so the strap smells disgusting. I wonder if I can buy those separately. Right, it's, it is kind of flexible, but obviously 20 year old plastic, you don't want to flex too far because it will just snap. There we go, oh, that's in, excellent. Now I need to fiddle it around to get the clip into the bottom panel of the thing. Right, what I actually found in the end was a pair of these kind of swan neck pliers were the thing I needed because I could get inside the dashboard and squeeze at that kind of angle, 90 degrees, and then it's all there. Now I just need to feed the clips back in to the dashboard and snap it all into place, which you'd think would be easy, wouldn't you? Don't really want to put too much pressure anywhere because obviously it's wood veneer and that kind of stuff does and can snap. At the same time, you need to put a bit of force onto it, because otherwise it's not going to go in. There we go, oh, suddenly it all just kind of falls into place. And that would appear to be a real wood dashboard in part of the car. Now we just need to reassemble the other two panels and we're there. Now, armed with a fresh cup of tea, don't forget all these mugs are available in the furiousdriving.co.uk web shop and channel members and channel patrons do get a 10% discount. I'm going to leave this plastic panel in place on these uh, restraining straps. I'm just going to refit the new old panel on top of them. So you don't have to disassemble quite as much stuff. I will now put all seven of these little screws back in with a drop of Loctite or thread lock on each one. I'm sure this won't take long because working upside down in the dark is my favourite thing in the world. I'm not quite sure why they use thread lock in this particular application because it's not like it's under an awful lot of regular stress. That's a weird one, but there you go. Right, okay, so this is all now screwed together. So all you need to do now is, as before, when it came out, just 
and slide it back into place. Oh, wait a minute, that's not, now I can see that's not sitting properly. So before I do that, I need to finagle this a little bit more and work out why that is not clipping in. There we go. There we go, that's in place now. Now I can fiddle this into place. Done. And finally, the last piece, the piece of resistance is this little fellow just here. There is a catch on there, not catch, I should say, part of the mechanism which rises up beyond the height of it. So you need to set that to a position about halfway so it goes in without fouling. And then, and then, and then, <laughs> this should be the easiest one of all, it should just snap into place. Uh, big peg on top. The big white peg needs to, to get gripped in place. Right, as is so often the case, the little bit on the end, which was the easiest one to come out, was the one that refused to go back in again under any circumstances. But now it looks like we've actually got a complete wooden dashboard here in the 75. Let's give it a final clean up. This is one of those jobs that in theory is really easy and people on the forum have done hundreds of times and said how, how absolutely simple it is. And in theory it is, it's just pulling stuff apart and then clicking it back together again. It's big Lego, but in practice there's an awful lot more to it and it does take quite a while to get it absolutely right. Now admittedly I have made things much more difficult for myself by transferring all of the air vents and clocking everything over from the old dashboard to the new dashboard but that has meant I've got a better looking uh, result because the plastic vents in my original dashboard were nicer and of course that foam is better as well. Battery reconnected and I've taken this opportunity to shorten this strap down. Incidentally, I have checked the plenum drains on this car actually a couple of times. It's got three, one either side that you can see easily. I was filling with dirt again. And one underneath here, which I did when I did the cabin filter and they're all running clear. And you can now see the clock is working again. And the fact it shows 10.30 on there, it's one o'clock now, shows this is about a three hour job if you're transferring everything across. So now here we have the proper wooden dashboard in the 75. Genuine walnut trim. Lovely. And if anyone has any alternative information that says that you can get real wood versions of these parts, then do let me know, because as far as I understand it, you can only get the fake wood bits of these. But hey, I'm open to, to correction. So there we go, not too difficult a job and a beautiful result to have some actual real wood here in the car. My baby Bentley is becoming a bit more Bentley-esque as is befitting of a baby Bentley. Not bees in that sentence. Hopefully this video has been informative and entertaining. If you've enjoyed, please, as always, hit like and subscribe. And join us again next time when there's going to be yet more car tinkering going on very shortly, whether it's back on the Crown Victoria, if I can motivate myself to get out with the grinder in the world or some more, or whether it's fixing that door lock, because like on the Freelander, I've got a non-functioning central locking lock um, that needs fixing as well. Then this car is very nearly up to snuff. Well, as I say, if you've enjoyed this, please do hit like and subscribe. If you want to support the channel, then take a look at Patreon or channel memberships. Links are both below because that helps keep this kind of stuff going on. Massive thanks in this particular case to viewer Anthony who donated this wooden dashboard because it had been uh, filling up his garage for quite some time. I'm sure he'll be happy to see this actually in the Furious Rover, the car with no name, Tock or Tick or something from that number plate. We'd call it, I don't know, some, something like that. As always, like, subscribe, head over to furiousrover.co.uk to find the interesting range of merchandise, mugs, stickers, magnets, uh, other things. <laughs> and join us again next time, I don't know, fixing, I don't know what, fixing something else. Take care and goodbye. Furious Driving, proud to be supported by Diamond Bright, protecting, cleaning and caring for the Furious fleet and for yours with 10% off using code FD10. Bidding Classics, the online classic car marketplace with more cars added every week. And Lancaster Insurance cover the Furious fleet. They are one of the biggest specialist insurers in the UK covering all areas of vintage to modern classic cars and motorbikes. Follow the links in the description below.